everyone. It's Alex Cahaya from the Index Podcast. I want to tell you about Mantis, a groundbreaking platform that's simplifying the way we interact across blockchains. If you're a developer or just into DeFi, you'll want to pay attention. Mantis enables trust minimized transactions across different chains, letting you trade or execute actions seamlessly while getting the best possible outcome, all without the usual complexities. Imagine being able to move assets and settle transactions across blockchains easily with maximum value extraction, all while staying secure and decentralized. That is what Mantis is bringing to the table. Mantis is an official sponsor of the Index Podcast and their founder Omar and I regularly host a new live stream series on X called Everything SVM. We have these live streams weekly and if you want to keep up with what's happening in the Solana ecosystem, especially as it relates to the new innovative deployments of the Solana virtual machine, you should tune into this live stream. Check them out at mantis.app and follow them on X at Mantis, M-A-N-T-I-S. At the Index, we believe that people are worth knowing and we thank Mantis for enabling us to tell the stories of the people who are building the future of the internet. We'll see you on the other side. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Index. I'm your host, Alex Cahaya, and this week I'm excited to be joined by Joanna and Nazreen, co-founders of Soon. Soon is the most efficient roll-up stack powered by the decoupled Solana virtual machine, decoupled SVM. Um, Joanna and I have known each other for quite a while uh, from earlier in her career, and these guys have a killer team that if you've been paying attention on Twitter, you've seen that they just re- announced their seed round or pre-seed, I guess, with a bunch of who's who of crypto. Um, so some pretty big names that are backing what they're doing. I know it was a mouthful in the intro, like what it is. We'll get down to that, uh, get down to some more details on what soon's building. But before we do, I would just like to maybe start with you, Joanna. Um, can you just talk about why you're building in crypto generally? Like what has driven you to work in this industry and maybe tell us a little bit about how you got here. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's a long winded road, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was uh, working on Wall Street as a currency trader for over a decade, and uh, one thing that you know probably made me one of the first people among my friends, at least, that heard about Bitcoin was uh, because of what I do. You know, I trade currency, fiat currencies, and one of the um, biggest topics back in 2012, 2013 was, okay, this new thing, Bitcoin, has, a, a potential, has the potential to take over the fiat. And I did what a currency trader would do, which is hedging my risk, career risk, with a personal investment in Bitcoin. Sadly, I, I used Mongolf, so all of that went down to zero. But um, wow. fast forward yeah, to 2017, you know, I, I started to realize it's more than an investment vehicle. It's a lot more uh, about the technology promise. You know, at the time, uh, Ethereum has started that whole smart contract narrative. And um, I kind of took a took a coding lesson to, um, to prepare myself for that um, transition to the, to the tech side. So um, really use that opportunity to meet a lot of great people within New York, uh, where I live. And we started this crypto NYC community that's a developer uh, first community. It's just a fancy name for a bunch of nerds that like to talk about white paper all day. Um, and we had this co-working space, you know, this was all pre-pandemic time. And um, yeah, just a lot of interest uh, in that space until I finally just realized, you know, why am I still like in Wall Street, like, why am I still working my day job when all I think and talk about is, uh, you know, breathe about is is crypto. So um, I took my first gig with Coinbase um, at the time as a, um, as a, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, on the leasing side, um, product manager, um, also working with Prime Brokerage, one of the first um, institutional product that Coinbase pioneered. And later on, moved over to the BD side and helped with um, launching that NFT marketplace. Uh, so that was my first um, full-time job with crypto. And then later on, I moved over to the real Web3 company, as a Coinbase person would say, <laughs> and worked at uh, OP and Alio as my last two, um, you know, last two big jobs as head of BD. 
and yeah, and that's where we met too. when you were working with Elio. Uh, I think that was like the first right. time we crossed paths. And um, right. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more. But two things that pop up for me from your story: one is you know you're an OG if you got rugged by Mount Gox, um, <laughs> and li- literally, literally everyone has has had some. If you've been in this space long enough, you've you've probably made some error or gotten caught in some kind of thing like that. Um, even me, like I, I, I lost funds on FTX. Um, not a whole lot, but I like, yeah, when, when all that was going down, I sent, um, a bunch of crypto off of FTX and it happened like instantly, right. It was like on Solana, I got it off. And then I was like, Oh, there's this little bit of cash. I'll just ACH that it'll, it'll be fine. Never showed up. <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to get it all back, uh, eventually, but yeah, I just, I can commiserate <laughs> with some of that. Um, yep. uh, th- the other thing that, uh, I w- <laughs> yeah, I want to get into this a little bit later in the show after Nazarene goes, but you know, I've been very impressed by your ability to execute over the, especially watching you like ship soon and do the BD work to get soon off the ground. It's been quite impressive and seems to have happened like overnight. Um, Uh, and you know, doing that, being a founder and I know you have a couple kids at home. Like this is like not a, you know, neither of us are, are 20 years old with no responsibilities, um, and building companies. So I think that's a kind of an interesting founder conversation to have that, uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, founders in the space who are in that position can relate to, but, um, yeah, Yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm not, um, you know, I usually say this as a joke, but I'm not really joking when I say, you know, I'm basically spending all my time now with the third kid because yeah. soon I have two kids <laughs> and soon yeah. is my newborn. So I spend more time with the newborn than, you yeah. know, I kind of had to sacrifice the family time, um, Sally, but it is, it's just like having a baby, right? There's never a good time to have a baby. So you just yeah. know, right? um, and you go with it. Um, so yeah, we, uh, definitely it's been it's been great to um, to be able to finally like you know do my own thing and um, put the team together. I think I trust my team the most, and um, as they as they place their trust in me, and we we've been able to ship like uh, like the speed of light. Yeah, and there's there's never a good time to start, except for like right now. <laughs> You know, like that's just the thing I've learned. Like if you don't, and that's with anything, whatever goal you have and thing that you want for your life, this vision that you have, um, and the the older I've gotten and, you know, have, I have three kids, you know, the more I've realized, um, that you just have to live the life you want to live. And if this is the dream that you have, you got to take that, you know, you just got to do it. Um, there's the, the do you scared? Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, like I, I posted it everywhere. Um, you know, the decision metrics is like, you either do it now or you do it, but you're scared, then you do it scared. <laughs> so yeah. you, you're going to have to do it anyways, because nobody, yeah. if you don't, yeah, um, bad for yourself, nobody else will. So Nazreen, what's your story? Why are you here? How did you get here? So um, my background actually was in political science. I've always been curious and interested in how the world works and wanting to do things that actually change the course of the world. Um, But I didn't have any uh, delusions about working in politics. Um, I think at that time, you know, Elon Musk was up and coming. And what I realized was that sometimes the best way to to impact the world is to take the third path, as in don't be a uh, player in the main game, but exist in a parallel system. So just like how Elon Musk, you know, started, you know, private companies to change these things, as opposed to trying to lobby for regulations, which is like, you don't control things there, right? And um, and I I learned this as well because I started some uh, project that was tracking the promises of politicians. But um, what happened was that in my country, Malaysia, they changed governments um, without an election. And I realized at that time that, hey, this is like wasted effort. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I need to, you know, think of um, something else. I took a step back from being this, uh, you know, activist, NGO organizer, um, and I started programming and I really liked it. And one thing led to another and I ended up, you know, like a couple, two years later, I ended up working for Amazon, um, AWS, um, as a software engineer. And, uh, you know, while I was like, you know, being in big tech, like, uh, I started to pay more attention to, uh, to web three. So back in 2017, I bought some tokens, but I didn't, I wasn't developing yet. 
Um, but then uh, in uh, 2020, I realized that, hey, why am I not um, also building in a space? Because this is, you know, blockchain, uh, this technology is something that's going to impact a confluence of three things, which are politics, finance, and technology. So the politics bit is going to take some time, but definitely finance and tech, we're, we're seeing it uh, being impacted right now, right? We, we know that blockchain technology is going to change how all systems uh, work. Uh, it's just that to the normal person, they might not realize that it's blockchain underneath by the time that it permeates everything. Um, and so I, I left AWS, um, not in the best of times, not, not in the, the best market conditions to go into Web3 full-time because I made a promise to myself that by this certain date, um, I would just go into Web3 and I did. Um, and at the same time as well, I, I moved away from the UK. I started digital nomading. Um, and then I, I realized that, hey, you know, Asia is pretty cool and I think it's up and coming again. And uh, I moved back to Asia um, last year. Wow. Really cool story. And I think it's been, so I've had, this is actually the second podcast that I've had. The first one was called Follow the White Rabbit. And it was with a company called Orchid. They were building a decentralized VPN. It was why I got into the space and they originally like started working full time back in 2016. Um, and that show is about the intersection of, of human rights, privacy, technology, and democ democracy. And your comment up about Malaysia r resonates with me. And it's a very common theme uh, amongst people who, did not grow up in the U S that grew up in different countries that don't have the kind of stability, both financially and from a government, uh, perspective, uh, as we do. And I think it's a big reason why in the U S there's this disconnect with the broader public around what crypto is and why it's important. Um, and Lily Lou actually brought this up on a spaces yesterday. Um, she's the president of the, of the, of the Solana foundation. Um, this one thing that unites all of us, I think in this space is this idea of self custody that we believe it's important to be able to self custody your assets. Um, because that like money finance in self custody of your assets is what I think gives governments power, right? Like the, the ability to control the banking system and uh, control your, your money. Uh, and, um, it's also what gives self custody for an individual is what gives them true freedom right? Control over their assets. Um, and if you grew up in the U S you don't really know how bad that can be. Right. But if you grew up in like Malaysia or Ukraine or like list off any number of like, I'm using air quotes here, like third world or like emerging markets where, um, your net worth can be reduced by 50% overnight from inflation or a new government takes over and you can like no longer access your bank account or something like this stuff happens. Um, and I, I don't know, self custody to me is like one of these things you would think would be like the most American ideal, uh, <laughs> but it gets like a lot of resistance. Um, so I, I just point that out because I'm like always trying to connect the dots here of like why this is important to my, to, to us, to the people on the show so that our audience can start to think about that. Um, so Joanna, you were at OP stack, right? Working at OP. Um, can you explain, a little bit about like what that is uh, and maybe connect that dots to soon what you guys are trying yeah. to do um, on Solana or with like the Solana virtual machine. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, you know, OP stack is a tech stack that allows people to uh, use the code base to spin up their own chain. Right. And um, the underlying tech there with optimism is the EVM, right. E e Ethereum's virtual machine. Um, and I think when, when I was there, I, I really saw like with my own experience, how, how quickly that grew into a, um, a, you know, a great playbook, right. For, uh, for projects that, you know, has a general purpose chain. They also have the tech stack that can help other, um, you know, either developers or businesses to spin up their own chain. So for application purposes, that's, you know, net net positive for the for the general purpose chain brings legitimacy to it. You know, use Coinbase as example, right? Obviously, um, I was at the other side of the table, so helping Coinbase launch their base chain that adds uh, legitimacy to the to the optimism mainnet, and this is exactly kind of the inspiration that we took uh, when we looked at the the current landscape. Like, what's the next gen VM, right? What is the who is going to win this? Who is going to be, um, you know, 
the who's going to uh, bring that end game to the table. And we did a lot of research amongst all the um, next gen, you know, so called next gen VM that includes, you know, and move uh, VM, uh, SVM, uh, parallel EBM, and you know, few, uh, you may have a few other suggestions, but at the end of the day, we looked at the maturity, which is like years since existence, you know, Ethereum being around for seven. Um, but parallel EVM really hasn't been um, production ready, right? It hasn't been battle tested for, for any, any time. Like I'll give zero to that, right? Two years for a move. Um, Solana VM has been around for five and um, all the you know other ones are just also like in research phase. So when we balance that out with the performance metrics that we see on Solana, especially with um, Farad Dancer coming up, you know, bringing up the TPS to half a million, you know, 650K uh, in some cases, that just made us such a you know, big bulls for SVM. And we want to be playing a major role in the process of you know, getting that SVM adoption um, accelerated across other ecosystems, not just in Solana, but other ecos. So that's what the soon vision is, um, basically bringing Solana's VM into other L1s, starting with Ethereum, then we're going to move to Bitcoin, then we're going to move to Cosmos, etc. So um, I have a lot of thoughts about this, uh, but before I get into that, I want to I want to note two things. One is, Nazarene, I'd like to hear your explanation to uh, a non-technical person what a VM is and um, how, like, why that's important and like this, and then get into like the specifics around the Solana virtual machine, which is the SVM, and why that, like, what are the benefits of that? That's one thing I'd like to talk about. Um, after that, I think Joanna, one thing I'm really interested in personally, and I think would help a lot of founders, is just like talking about your go-to-market strategy and like how long I'm just very curious to hear the story about it too. Like what was the actual strategy, but also like the timeline. Cause I know you were at, at Alio. I don't remember when exactly it was that you transitioned out of Alio, but like, it's not been, it's been less than a year. Maybe it's been six months. Um, and so I'm like, y'all went from team formation stage, maybe like six months ago to like, completed your pre-seed with a dev net out and all these like top people supporting you in six months or something like that. Right. I mean, that's nuts. Um, and so I think, I don't know, I think I'm interested in hearing that story and I think other founders will be too. Uh, but before, so I just want to note that mental notes start thinking about that one. And then Nazreen, like, let's get into the X, ex- we'll dig into the tech a little deeper here, um, for a couple of minutes before we get into the GTM, the go to market strategy. Sure. Yeah. Um, so what is a VM to a non-technical person, a virtual machine? You can think of it as the operating system. So if you have your phone, it's like iOS or Android. And the reason that it's important is that it dictates how applications on the blockchain works. Uh, what was the next question? No, that's it. No, so yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. So it's just very simply, it's an environment where you can execute a application and these applications just live on a blockchain and you're basically making it so that um, the Solana virtual machine, which is a type of operating system can work on any blockchain, like any blockchain um, they can execute contracts on that live on that chain, like Ethereum, for example. Right. Am I getting that right? So it's, it's, more well, I guess like, it's a roll up. Um, so it lives exactly. on, it lives on yeah. your roll up chain and then it, and yeah. then it settles down to that, that, um, yeah, that 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 change so talk about that a little bit for people so you, um I, th- I think um you know you know back in the day uh when laptops were a lot less performant um you know people would think oh like i need to upgrade my ram right and uh, one way to do this is that you replace the, the internal ram like in your computer but there was also the possibility of extending it through um uh, USB, you can convert a part of your USB to uh, to RAM memory. So you boost the uh, the memory of your computer through this extension. So yeah. roll-ups um, are a bit like this, where you have the main machine, you can think of that as an L1, and you attach things to that main machine, and that basically boosts or extends um, that main machine. I'm a fist bumping over here for people who are listening to the show and can't see, but that's one of the coolest explanations I've actually heard of what a roll up is. <laughs> um, it's, no. it's so hard because we have, the, the, there's all this infrastructure terminology 
that um, is so, I mean, people who live and breathe this space don't even understand, you know, <laughs> and we're going through that right now in the Solana virtual machine, this like alt SVM space, network extensions, roll ups, so whatever, like uh, ephemeral L2s, you know, there's this crazy amount of, yeah. of terminology and it's just hard to visualize what, how it all works. Yeah. I mean, Alex, you gave me an assignment, explain it to non-technical people. I took that assignment, man. Yeah, it's great. No, it's a good job. I mean, yeah, so you just like plug it into your USB port. It's kind of the same idea. Um, it's just there's, a, you know, multiple, it's just different servers communicating with the the L1 that is sort of that interface to connect. Of course. Um, of course, down. yeah, there's the, there's the question of how exactly they communicate with each other, what's possible, you know, like there are things that depend on the L1 or the main machine, and there are things that can be run on that um, extension machine. Uh, that cannot be transferred over, but then some bits of the data can be transferred over. Yeah. All right. So, and then the soon stack is kind of like the OP stack where you guys have created a bunch of standardized technologies and tools that any developer can go use this open source software to deploy, um, a, a roll up on top of any other L1. And just to give people, like, let's talk about Bitcoin. Maybe give, uh, maybe Joanna, you can jump in here and give like an example of why would you need this on Bitcoin? Why do you need an extra layer of infrastructure for building apps on Bitcoin? I think it's the best example. It's even better than Ethereum in my, in, in my opinion. Um, but uh, what, why, why do you think you need that? Yeah. So look at the, um, Look at the, the applications that are spending a lot of time um, constraining their, you know, execution um, environment to the, the chain limitations, right? Like doing all this tweaking, um, you know, like um, all the application that wants to, to have high performance, low TP, uh, low fee, high TPS um, kind of um, uh, execution environment. Now they don't need to worry about... Um, you know, not being able to attract the liquidity from um, these L1s like Bitcoin, right? And users, um, while they still um, use that like execution environment. So basically, we're we're all about modular <laughs> approach. I think the best way to explain this, right? So you take the best of the two world, right? You got the Solana's um, parallel execution, which is just inherently much better than any other VM because of the um, you know, the design choices. And uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, it's also very clear that, you know, it adds all that, um, unlock you know, all that use, use cases that are only leveraging um, Solana virtual machine, right, into the, the Bitcoin ecosystem. So like think of it as VM in this case as a, as a bridge, right? We're bridging, um, we're giving these people, like the, the developers, the apps, a bridge to cross that river from um, you know, like the Stone Age, I would call it, to to actual like high perform, highly performance stage, right? So, yep. um, without really losing their audience, without losing losing their user base. Well, I think another way to articulate this is like Bitcoin was designed to be a store of value, and it was kind of intent with the proof of work, the way that this software was architected. It wasn't really meant to be like cheap and fast. Um, it was meant to uh, be the most secure way to store value on the internet. Um, and it does that really, really well. Uh, but people who have Bitcoin, they like want to do things with Bitcoin other than hold it. Some of them do, right? They want to like participate mm -hmm. in decentralized finance um, and all sorts of other things. But building apps on Bitcoin is like kind of impossible. You can't build it directly on that layer using that technology. So the what you guys have built and there are other teams working on some similar things um, enables an application developer to build an app on the, using the Solana virtual machines operating system that executes in the way the Solana virtual machine enables it to execute, but they can use Bitcoin. So now you can, now they can actually benefit from all these innovations that we've seen happen in, in DeFi, especially, um, but still benefit from some of the security <laughs> guarantees. That's, that's totally fine from this, from like Sorry. some of the security. No, no, you're good. You're good. We'll edit it out. Um, just from like some of the security, the security guarantees that we have, um, on, on the Bitcoin network. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, like a great way to articulate why there's all this experimentation in the roll-up space, but particularly what you guys are doing, I think 
we've primarily seen rollups focus on Ethereum as scaling solutions. Um, and I don't think that these are as much a scaling solution for Bitcoin as a usability, um, like an access maybe. I mean, I guess it is scalability too from an application standpoint, but I, it's, I, I don't really think about it that way because Bitcoin, I don't, in my mind, was never meant to be a general purpose blockchain for building apps, right? It just wasn't, that's not what it was for. Um, so I don't know, Nazarene, do you have any other thoughts to add to that? Um, I mean, I, I agree with you, right? Like, um, so every, every chain, you know, optimizes for different things too. But of course, you know, every other chain after Bitcoin had the benefit of hindsight, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, it's not just the, um, the tech side of the SVM that we're bullish on, but it, it's also the builders, um, the culture of the builders that have built on Solana that we want to help to extend to other ecosystems. So people who, you know, probably Bitcoin maxis are, uh, the ones that are less likely to venture into other ecosystems. Um, like these would be people who would greatly benefit from um, SVM applications being deployed into their ecosystem. Like what you're saying to unlock, um, to make use of that liquidity, um, but to also actually participate um, in, um, in Web3 or decentralized anything, but still um, remain in their ecosystem of choice. So, uh, Joanna, let's talk about your go-to-market strategy. I'm ready. I think we're at the point where we can switch gears a little bit. Um, I am so curious in like how you thought about that and like the Genesis story maybe is like a good place to start. Like when did you guys start working on soon and how did you, uh, do this so quickly? I mean, not just from a, and Nazarene, you should talk too, like about the technology piece. Like it just seems like you've gotten to DevNet with like a product in a seriously short period of time. Um, so yeah, Joanna, talk about, tell me, tell me about this go to market, um, and like lessons learned suggestions for other founders, like anything you can think of that pe would help people, um, who might want to bring a project to, to market in this space. Yeah, for sure. So we, um, we have been thinking about this idea for a while um and and i think a lot of this kind of uh, was done behind the scenes right before we even officially started the company in may um but um but yeah i think we really were fortunate that um the my co-founders um the other co-founders came from the polka dot and near ecosystems and they um you know already have a group of engineers that we pretty much aqua hired um, from those ecosystems. Those are all large all one um, Rust based collectives, right? Like uh, a lot of um, uh, Rust developers that you know are ready to to switch over to SVM side, and we didn't really uh, make a lot of pitfalls when it comes to um, development. You know, just being uh, very much conscious about the design choices. You know, we were very pragmatic team so we made uh, the choice to go with op stack to, to do the optimistic rollup versus a tk rollup also because of that you know we prioritize shipping speed um and um and we also made a lot of choices um you know by like understanding the landscape very well and talking to folks like you you know who's been building an svm world for a while and um anza you know it's another Know, great example of this, we we were able to leverage some of the work they have done on the SVM split, but really been innovating on top of that and further modularize you know TPU. Right? That's what's making making this a decouple SVM possible. Um, have the SVM um, work that has been done by Anza to be not fit for a rollup use case. So um, I think all of that is to say that you know we came prepared. Um, we have a team that has been building L1, L2 professionally for a number of years. And, um, and in terms of the, the whole like fundraising story, story it was also uh, very deliberate. You know, we, we debated internally like if we wanted to entertain any VC offers and we decided to say no to that. And only one with, um, you know, took a long time to, to pick the, 
uh, the 50 high quality angels that we have on our list and we spend one month talking to that entire list one-on-one -on -one and pitch every single one of them and we got 44 yeses out of the 50 and um, you know I wouldn't really recommend this to other founders I would say because it's very uh, time consuming but it was really worth it at the end uh, in our case because we needed the the early supporters to help us you know with building narratives with um, all the technology, you know, innovations that we made, we will um, need those um, technical advisors to to, chim uh, to chime in as well and, you know, to help balance out the, um, like, you know, to make, sh make sure that whatever we're building is actually valuable, right, to the community. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how we did it. It was very much of a uh, labor of... Um, is that labor of love? Is that the right word? It's, yeah, it's it a is. lot of it's hard right labor. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, a well, lot I think, of, uh, I think like, it's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of people's perception would have been the one that I had, like, oh, this just came out of nowhere overnight. But the, right. the true story is, and this is the same thing for me with, with ABK Labs, like, this is actually my entire career behind this. Like, it's been 15 plus years of work and relationship building like even down to the, my yeah. co-founders, like I've known them my whole professional career and I've been building those relationships and your ability to go out and get those 50 plus people to even talk to you is because you've built these relationships over a very long period of time. And so I think the lesson for founders here that are just starting out in this space is like, you need to go out there and create a lot of value for a lot of people over time. Yeah. And then one day you will have the right idea with the right Rolodex of connections to help you make it happen. And you'll reach out to them and they'll want to work with you because you've already given them something of value. Um, I say this because I had a call with a guy uh, the other day. I'm not going to say who it was, but it was just a kid. Like he was like 26 and he was kind of like at a little bit out of his depth on um, the value that he brings to the table. Uh, and I find this a lot with like a lot of young people. They're like, Oh, so-and-so follows me on Twitter and I'm just trying to make it in this space. And, blah, blah, blah. And like, I like, I appreciate the sentiment, but like the real work is like, do it's not like who follows you on Twitter. It's like, right. what can you build and who have you built it with? Um, yeah. that's actually the, the value, um, that, that you bring to the space. And you guys clearly have that in spades, which is why you're like, Hey, we make a phone call and we get a bunch of engineers. We make another phone call and we get like a good connection who can, who can help us. Cause you just, you just have those, those, those things kind of built up in your stable. So valuable, I think a valuable insight, um, you know, it wasn't an overnight success, actually. It's like years in the making for everybody involved. Exactly. Exactly. So what about you, um, Nazreen, like anything to add to that Genesis story? Other, other comments? Yeah, I, I think I have to state a disclaimer here, Alex. I'm flattered, but I'm not a co-founder actually. I'm <laughs> the head of DevRel. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> All good, but I would I would take that promotion, Alex, if you would uh, speak to Joanna, <laughs> and I would gladly take that promotion. No, I'm kidding. Um, so Joanna basically um, covered um, most of um, why we were able to ship so quickly. But I think one of the the key um, uh, um, reasons is basically black boxing everything else that w is not the priority. So for us. The priority is maxing out the SVM, right? So the SVM is already performant, yeah. but for, for a roll-ups use case, um, well, first and foremost, we need to make sure it's secure. And then we want to make sure that we can uh, tweak uh, the performance to even higher. What that means is that, okay, for everything else, if we can reuse components out there that we know are secure and good and performant, let's do it. So that's why we decided to build upon the OP stack. We don't need to reinvent cross-chain messaging between the L1 and L2 and bridging on the L1, right? And at the same time, the, the revision layer, um, the specs as written by um, Optimism are already very detailed. We don't need to waste time redesigning that. We do need to put in a lot of effort into implementing it because um, to make the OP stack work with the, with the SVM, no one has done it before. So uh, that's innovation on our side. Um, and we need to make sure that we focus the majority of our engineering efforts on the work on decoupling the SVM, because that's, again, something new that we are bringing to the table um, and making it secure. So it's pretty much understanding what is the uh, 
what is the focus of the innovation right now? Um, and, uh, and for everything else, um, as long as it's secure and performant enough, then we don't need to reinvent that, right? Because we know that there are projects that try to reinvent everything. Uh, at the same time, that's, that's, that's not going to lead to fast shipping, right? Yeah. And we, we, want, we want to be able to put uh, our product out there first, you know, let people experience it, and we can iterate upon it, right? Like we have several things that we'll release after um, our mainnet lined up. But uh, the, the, the goal is to have something real uh, reaching people. As, as, I, as I, soon you kind of, yeah, I love that. I, you, you, I like the soon reference. Um, you, uh, you, you really hit on something pretty important here too. That's, I think, another big takeaway for people listening, which is focus. Um, and um, there's a, a, the, I talk about the why a lot. This is like the Simon Sinek thing, but it like really helps me um, internalize ideas and get people going in one direction together. Um, is having a really, a really solid why. And you guys clearly have one. I don't know if it's, if it's the, the main one, but one like thing for you that's come out of this podcast is this idea of, does this allow us to ship fast? Um, like this question, right? Like this is another way to get to your why's like have this resounding question. The team always asks themselves and it helps like self-direct the key activities and the focus of the company. Um, and a friend of mine used to tell me a story just like by way of example of where this worked out really well, which is Oracle's uh, sailing team. Um, theirs was similar. It was like, does this make the boat go faster? Like if, if I'm working on something related to our boat, does it make us go faster? And if the answer is no, you're probably not working on the right thing. Um, and so this focus is actually how you, with a very small team, get a ton done um, and, and, and do the right things that help you get to market. Um, so my last question, same question I ask everybody at the end of the show, cause we're getting here to the top of the show is like, what have I asked you not asked you, sorry, that I should have asked. What have I not asked you that I should have asked? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say, um, what differentiates us, right? I mean, get down to the business. Um, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there are several SVM projects out there that focus on different things like scaling Solana. Um, we are one of the only ones that settles on Ethereum and other ecos. So, you know, from the get go, the, the focus is, is really kind of bringing these um, SVM into other eco, as I mentioned, um, and still on the other side. We get the liquidity and user base from um, from the from the other L1s. So uh, in this process, right, like what makes us different is number one, we're um, EM focused. We're very much a team that's strategically uh, situated and aligned with emerging markets. You know, many people on the team, except actually just myself and um, my head of BD, I just hired from Sushi. Everybody else is outside the US, right? So we already have these deep, deep connections on the um, on the developer side, and mm. um, we have um, we have been you know thinking about for the go to market side for developers. We will have these venture studios that help you know fund these future uh, to find the, the future founders, but also fund them right um, through this uh, assembly. And um, and the other thing I would say is. Um, what makes us different is you know, we have the tech stack, right? That's that's a very different strategy from some of the other, um, some of our competitors um, who are just building a general purpose chain. We're really focusing on, you know, this open sourcing ethos, right? To release our tech stack and their code base for the, uh, for the, for the public to use as a public good. But in the process, you know, we um, provide these one share path towards upgrades, um, one shared suite of tooling, one shared um, uh, suite of maintenance, right? To, to make it very easy for these chain operators to maintain and um, continue to you know, build distributions on top of their chains. And um, the other thing I would say is um, coming back to, you know, why, like the vision, right? Like the motivation, why we, we do what we do, like why we're building soon is, um, is the fact that we saw with the Ethereum example, a lot of these EVMs, L2s are out there, you know, building undifferentiated tech stack, right? And that, um, 
that basically cultivated this grand farmer culture where all the builders are just copy and pasting their applications and hopping around. And we saw, you know, with the Solana culture, builder culture is, you know, people choose, like this is literally what everyone says when I talk about the Solana culture is chewing glasses, right? Chewing glass and, um, um, and stay within, uh, stay beyond the cycles, right? To, to continue to innovate and get rewarded by doing so. So we want to be- well, I think you- I, I think you touched on something really important there with that I just want to talk about. So chewing yeah, chewing right. glass is like solving hard engineering problems, but staying beyond the cycle is like building real businesses versus exactly. like this grant farmer thing you're talking about just for people who may not be familiar, like all of these different chains, they end up getting huge market caps that are inflated by like large VC fundings and low float of tokens and not many tokens circulating supply. And then a lot of these builders would just go and like apply for grants to build like something that's pretty obvious that should be built on that chain, like some application that's on five other chains that this chain wants. And they get paid large amounts of money to do that. And that's not like a real sustainable product that's like solving a real problem. I and mean, we think we, we think we see we like Mert talk about this a lot on Twitter, you know, and um, this really is the Solana cultures like solve real problems that yeah. last, that, yes. that build sustainable yeah. businesses. It's kind of funny that it's that you know that, that it's that, that we have to be like, like say that yeah. but you know yeah, we're, we're yeah, trying to get back to the basics here exactly we're sick and tired of this uh research infra um face right where everyone yeah. keep talking about like oh how do we just build another undifferentiated tech stack like that's why we bring the end game to it we're just we're not just another you know EVM how to, right? We're actually bringing a new virtual machine to the game so the developers can focus on what they do best, which is bringing the best user experience, right? And then the user will benefit from this too. So, you know, this is, um, this is the motivation we, you know, we keep going back to is um, how do we, how, how do we bring like these high quality dApps into the space? How do we grow the overall pie? And, um, and we see a lot of um, next wave of, uh, high quality de- depths uh, coming from the emerging markets. You know, just we want to be there to support the next Jupiter, the next Drift, the next Backpack. Well, I'll say um, this is why I wanted to work with you guys. Like we share uh, the same ethos. I, I started ABK Labs because I just wanted to build useful open source software together with like other people in the industry that I like. Our why at ABK is just build, just build together. That's, that's what drives us every day. And you said that basically, um, when you were talking about like this shared open source software. Um, and so you guys definitely have the right, the right makeup to, to be a very impactful project. Um, and I should have said this in the beginning, but we are advisors. I'm an advisor to soon through, uh, ABK labs. I should have called that out at the beginning. Might have to edit that one in, but, uh, if you're listening, I am a supporter, uh, along with, uh, many of the other people who supported the launch of this project and, uh, very appreciative to have have had you guys on the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you Thanks, all for having us.